Davis. Yeah, all the alphabetas are becoming rough. Isn't it sad? All cash. Welcome to the lecture. LA riots. Uh, Welcome. Special evening. I'm Michael Rotondi, the director of the Institute. This is the uh, 24th lecture series. It's the, 20, the beginning of the 24th year for SciArc. The, uh, Lecture series are organized by students in both the uh, fall and the spring, the graduate students in the fall and the undergraduate students in the spring. This lecture series, there's uh, posters that are on the table right outside the door for those of you that want to have a pretty great poster as well as the lineup which is a really great cross-section of active, creative people in practice currently. Some of the, not only in architecture, in wide range of fields, the changes that you should make note of, Paul Rudolph, will be lecturing on October 23rd, an important architect. And to those who know the work that he did at Yale as the dean in the late 60s and early 70s, he also is considered um, by some, including myself, to be an important educator. An add to the lecture series is Deborah Burke, who is an architect from New York who will be lecturing on October 18th. Another ad, very special one, Dolores Hayden, who was a professor at UCLA and was the mentor of some of the faculty here while she taught there and is currently a professor at Yale, will be lecturing on November 6th. She's author of um, the recently published book, The Power of Place. Then a final change is that Michael Sorkin, who was scheduled to give a lecture in the series, is postponing due to other commitments till the springtime. The students who produced this series, along with the help of Margie Reeve, one of our staff members who is in charge of exhibitions and coordinating of publications and lectures. Students who did the bulk of the work are Emil Mertzel, Martha Christian, Julie Eakin, Nick Gylock, Terry Hudak, Reed Stilwell, John Umbenhauer, and Chris Fiffner probably mispronounced a couple of those, but it's pretty close. We should give them a hand for the hard work that they did. I was able to wonder, think about what I wanted to say in a brief introduction about Mike because I figured it should be brief because almost everyone here is here because they know of his work, which is important work. But these thoughts um, 
came to me over the last three days while I was rereading City of Quartz on a trip to South Dakota. It's a part of South Dakota where in some places you can see the entire horizon, 360 degrees, which is a rare experience for me, I'd imagine for anyone. What I thought about and what I think about when I'm there or places like that is that my optimism and open-mindedness is in proportion to the distance between buildings and the amount of horizon that I'm able to see. So while reading the book, I was in quite a good mood, which often I am, even when I'm in Los Angeles, after I've had a conversation with Mike. Mike Davis, a native son, Southern California, born in Fontana, raised in a section of eastern, I guess east of San Diego, a place called Bostonia. He's known by trade as an urban theorist, a teacher, and what I would consider to be a practitioner. He's done many other things which has led him here. He describes what he sees, the outcome. He tells you how it got to be that way, the process. And he explains how it fits into, the, it fits into and operates in a much broader context, the cosmology. Woven through all of this, he evaluates it in reasonable but obviously subjective terms. What doesn't work? What isn't fair or just? And what needs changing? Generally, his subject is human existence. Specifically, it's the city and its community. The city is his zone of action. How it forms and how it transforms and why. He studies and dissects the sources of power, both natural and artificial. He analyzes how constructed realities of our artificial world overlay and interact with the natural world. The search and the research is for equilibrium. It's not only a question of intelligence or power. It's not an issue of capability. Rather, it's an issue of awareness. Awareness of interdependence and reciprocity between one thing and everything else. An ecology of mind, as Gregory Bateson called it, and as Black Elk spoke about it. It's a question of spirit. The world we have constructed is out of balance within itself and with nature. Mike Davis knows this. He is motivated, I believe, in the possibility of a total ecology of existence, no small task. He is constantly working towards that possibility. One place he does this work is here at SciArc, where he's been teaching for the last eight years, teaching by example. With exactitude, intelligence, and passion, he inspires and activates all that listen with an open mind I've always admired one particular trait. Even when he's confronted with events that are angering, he remains calm and is able to be with good spirit. We are honored to have him among us. Please welcome Mike Davis. The uh, good news is that I'm not going to talk about plagues or pestilence or emergent viruses tonight. Uh, the bad news that, is that I have one. Uh, I'm told it's called hand-in-mouth disease, and uh, it's epidemic amongst two-year-olds. And I caught it from my toddler. 
And because of this, I'm going to do something I've almost uh, always avoid doing, which is actually read uh, a talk. And I apologize for that. The exits are, are clearly marked. Uh, <clears throat> I have some laser device. If I injure anybody with this, uh, neither I or the school am liable, I think. Uh, let's see if it works. Something going to happen? Huh? What do I have to do? Oh, I point this at people. <laughs> so if anybody coughs or anything, I, I can kind of do well, Okay, I have it. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. I got it, I got it, okay. Let me try and set the mood first for uh, tonight's talk by recalling the, the events of January and March of this year. Because every decade, maybe sometimes twice a decade, Hawaii sends Los Angeles a big wet kiss, sweeping far south of its usual path the westerly jet stream hijacks water-laden tropical air from the Hawaiian archipelago and hurls it toward the Southern California coast. This Kona storm system, or as some local television weather reporters call it, the Pineapple Express, can carry as much as several cubic kilometers of water, or the equivalent of half of Los Angeles's annual precipitation. And when the billowing dark turbulence of the storm front collides with the high mountain wall surrounding Los Angeles, it sometimes produces rainfall of a ferocity that's unrivaled anywhere on the earth, even in the monsoonal, tropical monsoon belts. And indeed, Los Angeles area has held at various times the world record for the most rain in one minute, five minutes, and one hour. So the two-week-long Kona storm, which we experienced last January, differed little from the classic pattern except perhaps in the unusual intensity of rainfall in the South Bay area, forcing the evacuation of some of the low-lying neighborhoods in Long Beach, Carson, Torrance, and Hawaiian Gardens. Otherwise, the scenes were those of an ordinary, familiar disaster. Power was cut to tens of thousands of homes. Sinkholes mysteriously appeared in front yards. Pet animals and several children were sucked into the deadly vortices of the flood channels. Reckless motorists were drowned in flooded intersections. Lifeguards had to rescue shoppers in downtown Laguna Beach and million-dollar homes tobogganed off their hillside perches. Quite an ordinary disaster. What was exceptional was not the storm itself, merely a 20-year event, according to meteorologists, but the way in which it was instantly assimilated to other disasters as a malevolent omen. There's a growing popular apprehension that the land of sunshine is reinventing itself, to use a fashionable gerund, is a book of apocalypse theme park. Now let me see if I can. In less than three years, the megalopolis has endured three of the 10 most costly domestic disasters since the Civil War. The fierce February 1992, January 1993, and January and March 1995 storms, which had caused almost half a billion dollars damage, were mere brackets around the April 1992 insurrection, $1 billion damage, the October-November 1993 firestorms, $1 billion damage, and of course, the great Northridge earthquake in January 94 the total cost of which is yet to be calculated but will exceed $20 billion and is the most costly natural disaster in American history. From Ventura to Laguna and all stops in between, at least one million Southern Californians have been directly touched by disaster-related death, injury, or damage to their homes and businesses. This virtually biblical conjunction of disaster is unique in American history and it's purchased thousands of one-way tickets to Seattle, Portland, and Santa Fe. <laughs> After a century of population influx, there's now a net exodus out of Southern California. Middle-class apprehensions about the angry abandoned underclasses are only exceeded by anxieties about blind thrust faults and hundred-year floods. Meanwhile, Caltech seismologists warn that the Pacific Rim is only beginning its long overdue rock and roll. 
Kobe may be a 3D postcard of Los Angeles 2000 and waiting in the wings are the locusts and the killer bees. Uh, this is no exaggeration. Locusts frequently followed uh, droughts in the 19th century and uh, the killer bees just crossed the uh, border into California. Is it possible to have the house lights turned on now? I won't need slides for a while. It's easier to talk if I can actually see people. Anybody control the house lights? Oh well, I'll continue. It is unclear whether this vicious circle of disaster is coincidental or eschatological. Could this be merely what nonlinear statisticians wave away as the Joseph effect of fractal geometry, the common clustering of catastrophe? Or are these the last days, as prefigured so often in the genre of LA disaster fiction and film, from the day of the locust to earthquake and Wilshire Boulevard? Either way, Mandelbrot or Nathaniel West, millions of Angelinos have become genuinely terrified of their environment. Paranoia about nature, of course, distracts attention from the obvious fact that Los Angeles has deliberately put itself in harm's way. For generations, market-driven urbanization has transgressed environmental common sense. Historic wildfire corridors have been turned into view lot suburbs, wetland liquefaction zones into marinas, and floodplains into industrial districts and housing tracts. Monolithic public works have been substituted for regional planning and a responsible land ethic. As a result, Southern California has reaped flood, fire, and earthquake tragedies that were as avoidable and unnatural as the beating of Rodney King and the ensuing explosion in the streets. But the social construction of natural disaster is largely hidden from view by a perverse ideology that simultaneously imposes false categories and expectations on the environment, and then explains the inevitable discrepancies as proof of a malign and hostile nature. Pseudoscience in the service of rampant greed is militarized Anglo-American perceptions of the regional landscape. Southern California, in the most profound sense, suffers a crisis of identity. No belief, for instance, is more deeply rooted than the conviction that Los Angeles would be Death Valley, except for the great aqueducts that transfer the stolen snow melt of the Sierras and the Rockies to its lawns and pools. The city is advertised as the triumph of super engineers like William Mulholland, who built rivers in the deserts. A colliery of this Promethean claim, of course, is the idea that beneath the artificial landscape, there's something sinister and barren incapable of sustaining even a tiny fraction of the current multitudes. Yet Los Angeles County, while semi-arid, is no more desert than Murcia or the Côte d'Azur, which had the same annual rainfall. Technology and concrete have alienated any clear view of its natural history. In contrast, the written descriptions, the first written descriptions of the region, the 18th century diaries of the Franciscan Padres, Fathers uh, uh, Font, Palou, uh, Garza, and Crespi eulogized the waterscapes and natural fertility. Quote, all the soil is black and loamy and is capable of producing every kind of grain and fruit which may be planted, Father Juan Crespi wrote in 1769. We went west, continually over good land, well covered with grass. All the land we saw this morning seemed admirable to us. The diaries of Father Francisco Palou and Pedro Font also extolled the abundant springs, the Cienegas, the beautiful rivers, valleys green and flowers strewn. After crossing the true deserts of Sonora and Antigua, California, these Mediterranean men, and all the Franciscans were Mallorcans, were delighted by the familiar oak savannas and quote the infinity of wild rose bushes in full bloom. From their cultural perspective, it was a land well watered. The Anglo-American conquistadors, three quarters of a century later, however, were riven by confusion and ambivalence. Boosterism coexisted with an almost irrational fear of aridity, and there were great debates during the 1850s and 1860s whether California as a whole was an Eden or a worthless desolation. Yankee morale tended to wax and wane with the cycle of wet and dry years. Settlers found it almost impossible to form a consistent picture of the intermittent climate or the protean landscape. In the most fundamental sense, language and cultural inheritance failed the newcomers. English terminology specific to human climate 
was incapable of describing the dialectic of water and drought that shaped Mediterranean environments. Why no stretch of the imagination, for instance, is an arroyo merely a glen or, or a hollow. They're the results of radically different hydrological processes. Arroyos, to be exact, are studied via cusp catastrophe models, while tempered glens and hollows are analyzed via traditional stream channel models. So the Anglos were forced to preserve the more accurate Spanish terms without really appreciating their larger environmental context. And it was not until the discovery of the great artisanal basins, millions of acre feet of subterranean water during the 1870s, and the subsequent growth of the citrus industry, that a luxuriant stereotype of Southern California became possible. Even then, there was the initial mistake of advertising Southern California is semi-tropical. And of course, as Easterners thought about the idea of semi-tropical, they began to see green snakes coiled in trees and swamps. It's a sinister image. So ultimately, the, ra the railroad publicists and the Chamber of Commerce promoters repackaged Southern California as our Italy. For more than a century, this Mediterranean metaphor has been sprinkled like cheap perfume over hundreds of instant subdivisions. It has created a faux landscape celebrating a fictional history from which original Indian and Mexican ancestors have been censored. And its dismal nadir is probably Southern Orange County, with the endlessly regimented rows of identical red tile townhouses, a kind of affluent version of architectural Stalinism, are all located on cul-de-sacs called Avenida Sevilla or Via Capri. This specious Mediterranean facade is actively obstructed the recognition of the manifold and profound kinship between Southern California and the other mid-latitude regions of hot, dry summers and wild, wet winters, central Chile, the classical Mediterranean basin, part of Cape Province, and Western and Southern Australia. Comprising but three to five percent of the Earth's land surface, these Mediterranean littorals are the rarest of major environmental systems. Although the 19th century pioneer of biogeography, modern plant geography, Andreas Schimper, had marveled at the morphological similarities of their flora. Serious comparative research between the Mediterranean lands waited generations until the launching of the International Biological Program with financing from the National Science Foundation in the late 1960s. And thanks to these grants, hundreds of scientists in California, Chile, Italy, France, Israel, South Africa, and Australia were organized into unprecedented and continuing collaborations. A preliminary synthesis of their research, concentrating on the structural characteristics of Mediterranean vegetation, was prevented, I'm sorry, presented at the first international conference of Mediterranean type ecosystems. This is a body called Medicus in Valdivia, Chile in 1973. Subsequent Medicus conferences have been organized around themes of fire ecology, biological invasions, role of nutrients, biotic resilience, landscape management, and most recently, biodiversity. The cumulative impact of this research, now coordinated by the Mediterranean Ecological Society, has been the revelation of what we might call the deep structures of Mediterraneity, based on the complex interaction of biological and landscape evolution with climate. We now know, for example, that there's been a spectacular convergence of plant evolution in each region, as communities of different origins have adopted virtually identical strategies, above all, uh, scarlophily, to deal with the stress of summer drought. Comparative research has also revealed the profound ways in which aboriginal human societies have modified each Mediterranean ecosystem through the technology of fire. Hunter-gatherer societies were once seen as having almost no control over their environments or local nature. We now appreciate that groups like the native Australians and the native Californians were in fact fire farmers capable of creating you know, enormous and long-lasting changes in their landscapes. In fact, in both Australia and Southern California, it's almost impossible to know what elements or components of the original landscape at contact was not created or in some way structured uh, 
by human beings, and particularly by fire. Now, the Franciscans were intimately familiar with the dramatic landscape metabolism of the classical Mediterranean, so they were not shocked to discover similar cataclysmic cycles at work in Alta, California. They found abundant evidence, for example, of recent great floods, and while camped on the banks of the lovely Rio Porcioncula, of the LA River, both Fathers Crespi and Palou experienced violent earthquakes. Reasoning on the analogy of southern Italy and the local abundance of asphaltum, or brea, Palou speculated matter-of-factly that there were probably volcanoes here as well. But the hucksters of the 1880s who franchised Mediterranean California were selling sunshine, not earthquakes and deluges. Immigrants from the human states, moreover, brought with them deeply ingrained prejudices about climate and landscape that had been shaped by the environmental continuum of northwestern Europe and northeastern North America. In these temperate and forested lands, energy flows through the environment in an annually predictable seasonal pattern. Geology is generally quiescent, and natural powers are perceived as orderly and incremental, rarely catastrophic. The landscape seems generally in equilibrium with the vector of forces acting upon it. Indeed, the canonical evocations of the English and New England countrysides, the Reverend Gilbert White's Natural History of Selborne, written in 1788, and of course Henry David Thoreau's Walden, written in 1854, were microcosmic celebrations of nature's gentle balance, even, of course, as Thoreau was sounding a toxin against the ecological threat of the Industrial Revolution. This culturally relative and geographically specific view of natural process, resonant with what American naturalist John Burroughs called the pastoral quiet and sweetness and harmony of the English landscape, was transformed by Darwin's mentor, Sir Charles Lyell, into one of the great dogmas of Victorian science. Sir Charles Lyell is a figure somewhat forgotten uh, today, but he's the shoulders on which Darwin climbed. His three-volume Principles of Geology opened to the 19th century a vision of deep time, not just biblical time of 5,863 years, but eons, tens and hundreds of millions of years long, one of the most revolutionary changes in human consciousness uh, in the 19th century. But as both Martin Ruddock and Stephen Jay Gould have shown, Lyle's famous principle of uniformitarianism conflated the constancy of natural laws, a methodological axiom, with uniformities of rate and state, substantive claims. He believed that large-scale surface features were the result, quote, of insensible changes added through vast times, and that the Earth was a conservative, steady-state system without historical directionality. The moderate Whig, Lyle, waged ceaseless philosophical warfare against opposing tectonic model, which was most popular in France and Germany, of Earth revolutions. Catastrophism, whether biblical or Jacobin, it was branded by Lyle and by Darwin as pre-scientific superstition. Now, I would argue that a doggedly uniformitarianism mindset, which we might also call the humid fallacy, still conditions most environmental expectations in Southern California. Imaginary norms and averages are constantly invoked as standards. The weather, for instance, is always berated for its perversity, as in, well, we've had an unusually wet season or dry season, or the weather isn't like it used, used to be. And despite the daily reminders that we live in earthquake country, every high-intensity natural event, quake, flood, fire, Santa Ana wind, landslide, produces new shock and consternation. As one day survivor of the Northridge earthquake told the television crew, I feel like nature has let us down. Yet Southern California, at least by Lyleland standards, is a revolutionary, not a reformist landscape. This is Walden Pond on LSD. As in other Mediterranean and dryland environments, the average is merely an abstraction. Nothing is less likely to occur in Southern California than annual average rainfall. At City Hall, where annual precipitation is pegged at 15.3 inches, the mark has been hit only twice in the 127-year history of measured rainfall. Now, if you live in New England or Pennsylvania or Suffolk or Flanders, 
the average rainfall is actually a norm. And in any given year, your rainfall probably comes within a few inches of it. Nothing is more unlikely here. The actual norm is a 7 to 12 year oscillation between dry and humid periods. And sometimes the annual average is delivered during a single two week Kona storm sequence. Other times it may take two or even three drought years to achieve the same total. Likewise, in tranquil Hampshire or Massachusetts, rivers may swell to flood with a mere doubling of the normal flow. In Southern California, on the other hand, the Los Angeles River, metamorphizing from a trickle of sewage into a storm fred torrent, excuse me, <coughs> has been known to increase its flow 3,000 fold in a single 24 hour period. Local erosion and sedimentation rates also accelerate explosively. Fluvial environments in the Mediterranean basin, as in the arid American Southwest, behave in the same way. Environmental fluctuations, in other words, tend toward the exponential, which is why geomorphologists working in Israel and California have so eager, eagerly adopted catastrophe theory as a framework for understanding landscape processes. Indeed, nothing so distinguishes Southern California from classical Anglo-American environments as the contrasting role of extreme events or catastrophes. Research has generally supported Lyellian's stereotype that low or moderate intensity, high frequency events orchestrated in a seasonal cycle perform most geomorphic work in low altitude temperate environments. The English parson looking out at the robin on the tree, the raindrops falling, the seasons changing, everything reliable consistent, the wonders of subtle change over great periods of time, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, these are the, the cliches of that classical Anglo-American landscape. The opposite, however, is the case in Mediterranean and desert and regions. Here change is concentrated into short episodes, the equivalent of punctuated equilibrium in modern neo-Darwinism that inaugurate new steady states. High intensity, low frequency events, what we call disasters, are simply the ordinary engines of landscape and ecological change. For example, if sedimentation, the physical mass of erosion, is taken as an index of geomorphic work, then, quote, the bulk of the total sediment discharged into the coastal basins of Southern California during a 50-year period of stream gauging from 1930 to 1980 was, quote, delivered in a few days during the great floods of 1938 and 1969. These were the two so-called 100-year storm events in the 20th century. Furthermore, the extreme events that shaped the Southern California environment tend to be organized in surprising and powerfully coupled causal chains. Drought, for example, dries fuel for wildfires, which in turn remove ground cover and make soils impermeable to rain. Earthquakes may have already created new erosion surfaces and increased increase stream power by elevation change. In such conditions, storms produce sheet flooding, landscapes, and debris flows that result in dramatic erosion and landscape change. Vast volumes of sediment realign river channels, and before the advent of 20th century flood control engineering, even switch river courses between alternative deltas. Some of you know that in some epochs, the LA River drained into the Pacific through Bologna Creek, creating the immense sand dunes of, of El Segundo. At other periods, it switched back to San Pedro Bay, back and forth over thousands of years. Sedimentation also created sandbars that temporarily cut off tidal flow to coastal marshes, initiating in turn a 50 to 75 year cycle of ecological readjustment. This is not random disorder, but a hugely complicated system of positive and negative feedback loops, geomorphic and biological, that channel powerful pulses of climatic or tectonic energy disasters into environmental work. The outcomes, however, are radically unpredictable. The Southern California environment exemplifies the nonlinear rules of deterministic chaos governed by both probabilistic and deterministic elements. In such systems, entropy, and I mean entropy in the mathematical, not in the thermodynamic sense, or entropy in the sense of information theory, measures the relative degree of unpredictability or range of possible states. Southern California, accordingly, might be described as having high landscape entropy, a high degree of uncertainty as to the outcome, 
of any environmental event, which means that no environmental event simply repeats itself in a cycle. In other words, this is a historical landscape where each major event restructures the system in the context in which it tours. Each is unique. Similarly, physical environments can be distinguished by the extent to which they retain superficial expressions of their past history, once again as compared with the humid cratonic zones Mediterranean and dryland environments preserve events of great magnitude over longer periods of time. In other words, they have greater landscape memory. More of the past is visibly fossilized in the present. Present processes conversely overprint paleoforms and complex pathosets. And so, for instance, if you live where I do in Pasadena, at the alluvial foot of the San Gabriel Mountains, it's extremely difficult to distinguish some of the landslides and debris of the floods of this January or March from landslides and debris that are from a great Pleistocene earthquake, uh, I'm sorry, landslide uh, that occurred 12 to 15,000 years ago. This temporal and structural complexity of landforms in turn contributes to the relatively greater spatial heterogeneity and thus biotic diversity of Mediterranean environments. As one of my heroes, <clears throat> Stephen Pine, who's just finishing writing his epic five-volume history of fire and earth, points out in his history of, uh, of fire in Southern California, he says, the complex physical geography of Mediterranean landscapes makes possible a complex geography of light, the mosaic of microclimates sustaining a mosaic of microbiotas. The biodiversity of Mediterranean regions is second only to tropical rainforests. California alone has more than 5,000 native plants, about half of them endemic. And as you probably know, uh, Mediterranean cities or Mediterranean regions tend to have a staggering diversity of microclimates. In July, one day in July, uh, the LA Times reported that it was 112 degrees in Woodland Hills and 72 degrees at Venice Beach. I mean, where else in the world can you have a 40 degree difference in temperature in a single city? Finally, landscape and biome have co-evolved. Each of the ecosystems comprising the original biological mosaic of the Los Angeles region was evolutionary adapted to conditions of high entropy and periodic convulsion. And if you think I'm using complicated terminology, the Israeli Landscape ecologist Zev Navev, who I like to read, uh, <clears throat> describes Mediterranean environments uh, as perturbation dependent uh, homoeretic ecosystems. <laughs> Chaparral and oak savannas, for example, depend on wildflower to recycle nature, I'm sorry, nitrogen and ensure seed germination. And at least before dam building, floods periodically redistributed niches for aboriginal grasslands and riparian forests. This is a really big problem for people involved in management or restoration of, environment, of environmental uh, systems or ecosystems. Because all this depends on having some baseline, some original state, some climax form, some mature stage of the ecosystem. But in fact, the very characteristic of a Mediterranean ecosystem is that it's constantly in disequilibrium. It's constantly in, in flux or evolution. Coastal salt marshes, like the one we're standing on right now, were the products of cataclysm. Their whole metabolism was to be periodically inundated, destroyed, constantly re-ingesting, inundated again. How do you describe the original condition? There is no equilibrium or starting point. The, Table on the wall attempts to summarize somewhat caricaturally these proposed distinctions between uniformitarian temperate humid environments, that is the Anglo-American image or cliche of landscape, and disaster-driven Mediterranean environments. Some researchers, it should be added, are trying to use complexity theory to model the behavior of high energy Mediterranean environments as nonlinear dynamical systems. But if Ilya Pirogene and the Santa Fe Institute provide a framework for thinking about chaotic dynamic, dynamics, 
then so does Prophet John of the book of Revelations. There's an interesting irony in the mismatch of Lyle's paradigm with Southern California. The 19th century uniformitarians fought biblical literalism in the name of deistic rationalism, yet the Bible is superb environmental literature. In particular, it contains rich encyclopedic descriptions of Eastern Mediterranean landscape ecology that are far more appropriate to Southern California than the Arcadian idols of Walden or the natural history of Selborne. In particular, the Bible has very convincing accounts of the role of catastrophe in Mediterranean history. Now I move to the sexy stuff. The need for new environmental epistemology is most evident in any discussion of the massive single-purpose infrastructures that supposedly leash nature to the will of Los Angeles. As John McPhee has pointed out so eloquently in The Control of Nature, the struggle between human and natural wills is totally one-sided. Bureaucratic faith in the immortality of public works derives exclusively from attenuated, almost meaningless official time frames. In effect, we think ourselves gods upon the land, but are at most mere tourists. Our historical memory to begin with is simply too short to measure the rhythms of ecological time. If the average human lifetime is defined as 62 years, the native Californian culture spent at least 142 lifetimes accumulating sacred and reliable environmental knowledge. In contrast, Anglo-Americans have occupied this region for little more than two and a half lifetimes. Most of the major water, flood control, sewerage, energy, communication, and transportation systems are less than one lifetime old. If there's been a single fatal flaw in the design of Southern California as a civilization, it has been the decision to base the safety of present and future generations almost entirely upon short-sighted extrapolations from the disaster record of the last half century. For example, the region's multi-billion dollar flood control system was built to control a statistical abstraction known as the 100-year flood, in effect the great 1938 flood, which uh, reoccurred on the same scale in 1969. But how would storm channels, debris basins, and dams stand up to an event like the 200-year no deluge of 1861, 1862, which involved at least three times the greater volume of water and transformed most of coastal Los Angeles and Orange counties into a vast inland sea? You could have rode, by the way, from downtown to Newport Beach along the present route of I-5. Equally, what would happen if the dread Churbascos the Chubascos are tropical hurricanes uh, from the uh, coast of southern Mexico, which were so frequent in the 19th century but have been rare in the 20th century. If only three Chubascos had crossed uh, the coast of this century, what if they again became more frequent? Similarly, everyone knows that a great earthquake along the San Bernardino Mountains or Coachella Valley segments of the southern San Andreas Fault, something comparable to the Fort Tejon event of 1857. Uh, which was an 8.0 magnitude. Something like this is statistically overdue. Yet seismic safety legislation consists almost entirely of gr grudging a posteriori responses to smaller 20th century earthquakes like Long Beach in 1933, which was 6.3, San Fernando in 1971, 6.6. Moreover, last year's Northridge catastrophe, a moderate earthquake, a mere 6.7, radically revised disaster planning by demonstrating the incredible damage that could be caused by a moderate quake. As a result, it is now estimated that the inevitable 1,000 times more powerful quake along the northern or eastern San Andreas edge in the megalopolis could cause 140 to $200 billion in property damage. The same revision applied to the repeat of the great 1923 Kano earthquake in Tokyo. Uh, would involve at least $1 trillion damage by current estimates. Relative to obvious potential hazards, in other words, modern Los Angeles has been capitalized on sheer gambler's luck. And, as I try and show in this chart, the cycle of actual disaster has been serendipitously tuned to the same frequency as the business cycle. As Table 3 illustrates, the most damaging 20th century floods and earthquakes had coincided, excepting the 1987 Whittier quake, with recession or slow growth years. 
Incredibly, there were no ordinary disasters during the great booms of 1919 to 29, 1945 to 68. Cataclysm, apart from the moderate 1987 Whittier Nails earthquake, 5.9, has never interrupted a major business expansion, but has offered providential excuses for Keynesian countercyclical spending during recessions, most notably in 1934, 1938, and 1994. Indeed, one of these disasters had a most happy architectural consequence. The 1933, the March 10th, 1933 Long Beach earthquake destroyed thousands of structures roughly, roughly along an axis of Long Beach Boulevard from Huntington Park to downtown Long Beach. It also destroyed almost in its entirety the business district at Compton, killed about 121 people. And of course, when the rebuilding started in 1934, the United States was in the deepest winter of the Depression. Okay? Banks had just you know, been closed by the incoming administration. Nobody was building anything except in Southern California. This is the only building boom in America in 1934, thanks to the earthquake. And it just so happened that a movie that had just come out, Grand Hotel, had popularized a new style of design, Art Deco. So as a happy result of the 1933 earthquake, which I called in a seminar we did here at SciArc, the Great Deco Earthquake, you have the greatest concentration of vernacular, ordinary deco architecture in the world, precisely along the line of the 1933 earthquake. You can think about LA's advantages in disaster in other ways as well. Obviously, the 1906 San Francisco earthquake was an important factor in Los Angeles's early 20th century competition with the city that had once been the Queen of the Pacific. The two uh, murderous hurricanes, I believe in 1926 and 1928 in South Florida, put an abrupt end to the Florida boom for more than a generation and removed South Florida temporarily as a competitive factor with Southern California. By contrast, you can imagine how the history of Southern California might have been slightly different if its modern image had been shaped by experiences like the thousands of tourists who perished in the, perished in the Great Deluge of 1921 were swallowed in the great quake of 1963 as Gidget and all of her friends were sucked down into uh, the Newport Inglewood Fault. However, the historical record beginning in 1769 and largely anecdotal before 1880 scarcely hints at the real environmental anomaly of 20th century Los Angeles. Only in the last few years has it become possible via the decoding of new archives of climate and neotectonic history, ranging from undersea turbidity deposits and uh, varve deposits in the, in the San, uh, Santa Barbara Channel to pack rat mittens, even the bacterial scrim on, on desert rocks. We have suddenly in the last decade achieved huge new powers of, of, of revolution and insight into the environmental history of the last several millennia, and we're able to recontextualize uh, recent history. It has been an astonishing revelation. Scott Stein, recent study, Scott Stein's a geographer uh, at uh, Cal State Hayward. He spent most of the last five years waist deep in freezing cold ponds and lakes in the Sierras looking at dead tree trunks, most of them about eight or nine hundred years old, sitting in the middle of what are now lakes and ponds. His recent study of relic tree trucks, and it's, this has since been sensational in the science press, indicates that the last century was the third wettest period in California in 3,500 years. Similarly, an early tree ring analysis, an earlier tree ring analysis in the 80s of precipitation trends in western forests showed that the current water allocation under the Colorado Compact which was based on a, a very tiny record, 1907-1932, of anomalously high persistent runoffs. The tree ring ana analysis shows that this was the greatest and longest such anomaly in the last 450 years. That is, it was the wettest single period in the last 450 years. Other researchers have pointed to the unusually low variability of rainfall in the 20th century. To quote from one study, the modern California record differs from the longer period of the reconstruction 
in that the frequency of wet years and extremely dry years has been lower. This has led to one of the lowest rates for extreme events in the last 600 years. In other words, we have lived through a mild climate anomaly. And this has been accompanied, in turn, by unusual seismic quiescence, what is formally known as the moment deficit paradox. Quite simply, recent geodetic surveys, as well as trench section studies of active faults, indicate an earthquake frequency in the Los Angeles basin over the last several millennia that is dramatically higher than the record of the last two centuries. Too few quakes have been taking place to relieve the accumulation of strike slip and compressional, I'm sorry, compressional strain generated by plate tectonic motion as Los Angeles is borne northward toward Alaska. And the most dramatic uh, revelation of this was the work uh, done last year, or actually completed this year, by this huge research team led by James Dolan, who was at Caltech, is now at USC. And they tried to quantify this historical earthquake deficit and propose two possible scenarios. And I quote from them. In the first scenario, strain is released in numerous moderate Northridge-like earthquakes. In the second, strain is released in less frequent but much larger magnitude 7.2 to 7.6 earthquakes. It's been at least 210 years since one of these extreme earthquakes has occurred in, in, in the region. And they also say that 17 moderate earthquakes should have occurred in the last 195 years, but we've experienced only two. In other words, we're short either 15 northridge size earthquakes or one 7.6 event were overdrawn. In the event of either scenario, a deadly swarm of northridge sized quakes or bigger than Loma Prieta event, and this isn't on the San Andreas, this is right under us, like the Charnock fault up the street here a few blocks. The Dolan group predict a scale of, de of destruction that would, quote, certainly strain the ability of the region and the nation to absorb the resultant losses. It is important to emphasize, moreover, that they're considering seismic hazards only in the heart of the metropolis. They do not include the exurban San Andreas Fault or the San Jacinto Faults in their study. The calculation of this seismic deficit has gone hand in hand with the discovery since the 1987 Whittier Narrows earthquake of an ominous thicket of blind thrust faults which undergird the Santa Monica Mountains and the Elysian Hills, including downtown Los Angeles. A decade ago, seismologists talked exclusively about the big one on the San Andreas Fault. Now Caltech teams are studying more than 50 active faults that they believe are capable of producing at least Northridge-sized events in the heavily urbanized portions of Los Angeles, Orange, and Ventura counties. And my main point. The urbanization of Southern California, in other words, seems to have taken place during one of the most unusual episodes of climatic and seismic benignity since the inception of the Holocene. The urbanization of Southern California has occurred in a period with the fewest extreme climate events and with the mildest seismic activity in any of the periods that we're able to decipher with with, with uh, much confidence or high resolution over the last four or 5,000 years. It's an utter anomaly. So what would normal climate, what would a normal seismic regime mean? <clears throat> well, first of all, it's important to recognize that the new data is, a, is, is producing an intellectual revolution as well because it's rapidly undermining the old epistemologies of hazard analysis and prediction. As one odd geologist put it to quote, this is one of those rare moments in science when your observational systems bring you something you've never seen before. Seismologists, for example, are being forced to reconsider their Pandlossian belief in the long-range predictability of characteristic earthquakes based on the study of their recurrence intervals and the identification of seismic gaps. The embarrassing failure of the eight-year-long $20 million Parkfield quake prediction experiment together with the weird behavior of the 1992 Landers event, which did all kinds of things quakes weren't supposed to do, like hopscotching along different fault segments, 
and producing clusters of related earthquakes as far away as Yellowstone have created a Kuhnian paradigm crisis of the first order. As one eminent seismologist bluntly observed in the wake of the Northridge earthquake, quote, the American earthquake prediction program is utterly shattered. Likewise, some climate historians and hydrologists, particularly those who are studying water resources in the Southwest, are in open rebellion against what one calls, quote, the leap of logic and unscientific circularity, quote, represented by orthodox flood frequency analysis and engineering dogmas like the 100-year flood. As he says further, these words, of course, have essentially nothing to do with real years or real floods. Instead, the words represent an idealization based on often fallacious assumptions. They're an example not of science, but of insidious form of philosophical nominalism. These neo-catastrophist revisionists are united in their rejection of a Newtonian concept of environmental time based on clockwork repetition, the idea of predictable cycles of similar or identical events. From complexity theory, they borrow concepts of dissipated systems, fractal clustering, scale dependency, strange attractors, and tunneling. But the real thrust of their epistemological offensive, and this is something that's very infrequently pointed out in most of the popular literature, and of course, obvious bias of mine as a historian, <coughs> is to establish the historicity of the landscape process. In the words of one, quote, they show that there's a regular recurrence but except for specific periodic states, there are also elements of unpredictability, complexity, and chance events. The seismologist I quoted, actually Sina Lomitz, based in uh, the University of, 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 of Mexico, a wonderful writer and scientist, urges seismologists to replace the reliance on mechanistic periodicities with the more complex metaphor of the changing watershed where, quote, the drainage pattern is evolving and shifting with every successive flood. Every major event restructures the system that causes the events. USGS geologist Herbert Shaw, on the other hand, compares the new non-Newtonian hourglass to a surrealist clock marked off in unequal subdivisions, as well as to poetic time calibrated simultaneously by logic and nightmare or by order and disorder. In any case, large-scale extreme events are envisioned as imparting unique and unpredictable trajectories to landscape evolution. The El Nino Southern Oscillation, abbreviated as ENSO, is a superb example of this directional but nonlinear and catastrophe punctuated temporality. Solar energy stored in the tropical waters of the Western Pacific is released in coupled wind ocean current pulses, which often generate major storms in Southern California. In fact, there's a large community of archaeologists in Southern California who are interpreting the history of native California as a series of cultural adaptations to periodic or to aperiodic subsistence crisis caused by El Nino events. El Nino means uh, an increase in warmer water, which tends to cut off the upwelling of nutrients that make the Santa Barbara Channel and the area off of uh, Santa Monica Bay one of the, the richest and most productive marine ecosystems in the world. So periodically, El Nino events would not only produce floods and great erosion, they would lead to collapses in marine bioproductivity, to, to actual starvation. And they have correlated some of the major innovations in the history of the Chumash and the Gabrielino people to reactions to these, uh, these crises. So in some ways, El Nino Southern Oscillation is the rhythm section of our erosion cycle. It's the major you know, event, and it's a worldwide event as well as a you know, regional one, that we can read the signal in, in human time and environmental time. But it keeps time like an avant-garde jazz drummer and those of you who know about jazz drumming know that good jazz drummers use broken beats and superimposed tempos. You know, something like the beat of the human heart, which is slightly irregular. This perfect, precise clockwork timekeeping of artificial beats and disco music is a, you know, an absolute anathema. So I'm arguing that Enzo is kind of like Elvin Jones. 
Overlapping and variable frequencies of atmosphere-ocean interaction produce a disconcerting syncopation that is neither regular nor random. In fact, some recent ENSO researchers call this strange periodicity the devil staircase. And those of you who've read Mandelbrot know that the devil staircase is an irregular staircase, any piece of which you can, magnify, you can increase in, in size or reduce in size, and it'll look exactly like the staircase. And they call it the double staircase because it is composed of irregular steps leading to the threshold of chaos, rather like, I would imagine, the recent social history of Los Angeles as well. Meanwhile, it's unclear how or when this epistemological revolution, which is transforming geology, climatology, how this will impact on official resource and disaster planning. At the moment, there's a widening gap between science's new understanding of local environmental hazards and the inertial practice of underfunded public agencies charged with preparing for the inevitable emergencies. And I'm sure some of you are aware that the Republican majority in Congress is right now slashing the budgets for the scientific agencies that do the original research on things like global warming, you know, the San Andreas Fault, and so on. It is nonetheless urgent to reform the short-sighted practice of extrapolating from the modern anomaly to predict future events. Planning must incorporate the increasing likelihood of fractal disaster clusters as well as the probable return of events much larger in scale than the ordinary disasters the last 150 years. That is larger than the San Andreas earthquake, larger than the 1861-62 flood. Scientists have become especially concerned with the more powerful events that occur within the bandwidth of 200 to 1,000 years. Now, many, if not most, traditional cultures, as well as great urban civilizations like China, have long historical memories capable of preserving, capturing events that occur at these frequencies every 200 years, every 500 years, and so on. Uh, a recent a uh, very dramatic example of how cultural memory operates to remember environmental disturbances it was during the hysteria about the outbreak of uh, this virus outbreak, hantavirus outbreak in the Four Corners country, the Navajo Nation. And of course, people were freaking out. There was this panic and hysteria that the Navajo were carrying this. And they actually took pictures of people wearing gas masks with their windows rolled up, driving their Chryslers at 100 miles, miles an hour. And heroic work by the Center for Disease Control finally established that this was a absolutely classical pattern of an epidemic which was produced by environmental change or by an extreme environmental event, which was that you know, recent unusual El Ninos had produced unusually wet years on the Colorado Plateau, which had increased the production, I think it was, of pine nuts which these little deer mice live on, their population had exploded. And the virus which they carry, this deadly virus, Hantavirus, which recently has been also found in, a, of all places, Newport Beach, uh, suddenly had the critical mass to affect humans. But while the people from the Center for Disease Control were trying to figure out what the hell this was, they recognized that, that the Navajo already had a whole pattern of behavior which regarded rodents as really, you know, dangerous things. You know, the Navajo do not have anything to do with rodents. Keep them outside of your home. Never touch rodents. Fear, you know, fear rodents. And of course, when they discovered what the disease was, this was the most sensible and practical path to take toward this epidemic, indicating that the Navajo would probably experience similar spikes of deer mice populations and subsequent epidemics and other similar environmental events previously in their history, and they had registered and kept that event. But we, and I mean we only in the sense of Anglo-American California, does not have a historical memory or an experience that allows us to capture events on this wavelength. Now, one of these super disasters, of course, is the overdue great 7.2, 7.6 Los Angeles Basin earthquake discussed by the Dolan Research Team. Again, not the San Andreas Fault, but an earthquake of this size right within the basin. Another is the 500-year flood event identified by undersea studies of flood-caused turbidity deposits uh, in the Santa Barbara Channel. 
And these in turn may be linked to the coupled El Nino volcanic cycle, the two geoscientists at UC San Diego, Kuhn and Shepard, claim was responsible for catastrophic incidents of coastal erosion in Southern California over the last thousand years. But the really apocalyptic event within contemporary scientific crosshairs and the one that is probably creating more excitement and fascination than any other uh, discovery. And is now the traces of this, the, the, the dramatic evidence of this are now being seen all over the world, is the recurrent mega drought that Scott Stein identified from his studies of relic tree trunks. While the longest 20th century droughts, 1928 and 34, and 1987 to 92, lasted six to seven years, and remember the last drought, I mean, the state was in emergency condition. I mean, your, our lawns were dying, our, our swimming pools were empty, you know. Civilization was on its last legs. And, you know, droughts in the 19th century produced eco-catastrophes like in 1863 when half a million head of cattle died and before they died stripped the landscape of, of every piece of vegetation and turned Cal Southern California into a virtual desert. But these were six or seven year droughts. These, these are what, you know, state planners and hydrologists stay at nights worrying about. But Stein identified two medieval droughts, roughly from 892 to 1112 and from 1209 to 1315, that seemed to have endured for 220 and 141 years, respectively. And he links the, he's linked the first drought, which affected the entire Pacific uh, coast of, of both North and, and, and South America to the collapse of the most advanced pre-Inca civilization in, in coastal Peru, and the second to the collapse of the Anasazi culture of Chaco Canyon and Mesa Verde. Since then, there's been an explosion of research linking this event to the collapse of uh, lowland Mayan you know, urban culture. There's massive evidence that it produced an unparalleled environmental crisis amongst native Californians. It probably drove peoples of the Great Basin, like the Shoshonean ancestors, the Gabrielinos, put them in headlong flight toward the coast. Everywhere you can see evidence. I was at an archeological laboratory yesterday at uh, Cal State Northridge looking at pictures of bones dug up from a cemetery, a Chumash cemetery that's dated to this period, all of a sudden there's a huge increase in lesions, in wounds, arrowheads embedded in people's foreheads, where there's almost no visible evidence in, in, in skeletons of an earlier period of social violence. All of a sudden, you know, violence is epidemic, and it looks like there's a massive struggle over, over resources drought. By the way, this period is known in Europe as the medieval climate optimum. And in Europe, was responsible for enormous prosperity, the expansion of agriculture and the peasantry, the high Middle Ages. Baroque cathedrals, Notre Dame, Chartres, are the results of this climate period in Europe. But in other parts of the world, like along the you know, Pacific coast, it was disastrous. These mega droughts, moreover, were punctuated by an interval of intense humidity and recurrent flooding. To quote Stein, the medieval period in California was thus marked not only by severe and prolonged drought, but by abrupt and extreme hydroclimatic shifts from an ordinate dryness to an ordinate wetness and back again. Climatologists are well aware that the return of this Anasazi scenario might undermine the very foundations of capitalist hydraulic civilization in Southern California and the Southwest. Unfortunately, its likelihood is only increased by contemporary global warming. And indeed, scientists are using this medieval period as a kind of analog for examining what global warming may do, although it should be pointed out that there's no evidence at all of an increase in carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, the greenhouse effect, during this medieval rise in uh, world temperature by about one degree uh, centigrade. They actually don't understand how it happened or, for that matter, if it, you know, is in any sense part of some cycle. But global warming, which the leading scientific body responsible for setting global warming has just produced a document not yet officially released, but the New York Times managed to get a copy of it off the internet. And they've now come to the official conclusion that global warming has begun. 
let me <coughs> quote from one researcher, as global climate models become increasingly realistic, their mathematical results consistently point to a more hazardous world in the future. Ironically, a warmer global climate will ensure greater frequency of both extreme drought and extreme flood conditions. Some researchers, to be sure, believe that the mysterious persistence of El Nino warming in the Pacific over the last four years signals that this epical climate shift has already happened. It's also interesting to realize that 20 of the 25 most expensive insurance disasters in American history have happened in the last uh, 10 years. Now, finally, the, after crossing the desert of all this, the, uh, the conclusion. But metropolitan Los Angeles fatally lacked the emergency capacity, engineers would call it redundancy, to deal with earthquake clusters or inevitable 200 or 500 year floods. The cheapest and most sensible form of redundancy, of course, would have been hazard zoning to exclude development from the most disaster prone terrains combined with a conservative water ethic. Time and again, prophetic voices urged the region's leaders to mitigate inevitable disaster and enhance quality of life through restricting urbanization and wetlands and floodplains. They were ignored, and as a result, there's scarcely any open space left except at the outer edges to preserve as a buffer against temperamental, temperamental Mediterranean nature. In the meantime, it is unclear how Southern California will afford the escalating cost of ordinary disaster, much less the immense damage of probable mega events. The region's pharaonic public works are rapidly aging. Indeed, in some cases, their functional working lives are proving to be less than an average human lifetime. And I often take my students to Devil's Gate Dam in Pasadena, which was supposed to last for centuries, if not millennia. But after 50 years, is now completely filled with debris and turned into a sand and gravel quarry. Other Army Corps of Engineers frontline storage reservoirs like Hanson Dam are also nearing the end of their functional lives. As urban growth, moreover, ceaselessly replaces porous soil surface with concrete and asphalt, the flood control system loses its capacity to contain another 100-year storm event. Likewise, as Los Angeles' urban fabric continues to be extended into new floodplains, liquefaction zones, and mountain fire ecologies, the social costs of protecting private development from natural disaster are exploding. To deal with the impact of build-out urbanization in the eastern San Gabriel Valley and the western Inland Empire, the Army Corps of Engineers is spending almost $1.5 billion on new flood control works in the Los Angeles and Santa Ana River channels. In the wake of the Northridge earthquake, the California insurance industry is conducting a ruthless and, as we've seen thus far, successful campaign to shift the burden of homeowner earthquake insurance either to the public sector or to spread it amongst all homeowners. And indeed, this is happening nationally, where the insurance industry for the last five years has been lobbying ferociously for something called the Nas National Natural Disaster Act, which would make the federal government the insurer of last resort, but also force homeowners everywhere in America, even in places like uh, Vermont and the Texas Panhandle that aren't too earthquake prone to buy earthquake insurance. And the continuing growth of white flight suburbs in the California Chaparral Belt is raising the public cost of fire protection to unforeseen levels. So far, the Clinton administration <clears throat> mesmerized by the electoral prize of California in 1996 has been willing to spend more than $12 billion to finance the Los Angeles area's recovery from riot, fire, flood, and earthquake. But a full-fledged congressional rebellion has broken out against federal disaster aid. And originally, it was a rebellion of about 100 congressmen, both Democrats and Republicans from the upper Midwest, who supported a resolution from Representative David Obey, who some of you may know is a liberal Democrat from Wisconsin. And Obey pointed out to California representatives on the floor of the House. He said, you know, millions of people choose to live in coastal areas and earthquake zones because of the compensating attributes of those areas. You know, you guys get the surf and the sunshines, uh, Gidget and Disneyland. I don't see why taxpayers in the rest of the country have to subsidize this decision. And he proposed just to cut California and Florida out of federal disaster relief entirely. Let, <laughs> let them pay for it 
uh, entirely by, you know, you know, by themselves. What's actually happened, though, in the last year and a half is a fascinating story that's hardly been told in, in the national media, which is, you recall, the Republicans created something called the Rescission Bill, which was to strip about $15 billion out of already approved spending as a kind of down payment on deficit reduction. Some Democrats accused them of kind of setting this aside as a cash hoard to be then given back to the upper income brackets with the, Democrat, with the proposed Republican tax cuts. But they proposed to use part of it to finance the remaining portions of aid, about six and a half billion dollars worth, to victims of the Northridge earthquake and to some money for victims of Midwest floods and finally at the end even for the Oklahoma bombings. Okay? And after a little bit of, uh, I mean, some debate about which programs would be cut, President Clinton finally signed the rescission bill saying that this was a, a, a sterling, historic example of bipartisan cooperation showing the programs that should and could be, be cut. Okay? A small little item in, in, in the press. Rescission bill seemed complicated, even the word was unfamiliar. What in fact happened is that there's an absolutely ironclad national consensus between the leadership of both parties, at least temporarily, that federal disaster relief will continue to be provided, but it will no longer be added to the deficit. But like this last four and a half billion dollars for Northridge, it will come out of other social programs. What social programs were cut? Well, one of the programs that was cut was educational aid to Native American reservations around uh, the country. Summer youth employment, including all of next summer's federal summer youth employment aid, you know, the traditional program that was started after the ghetto rebellions of the 60s. They give jobs out, but only in the summer months. That's been entirely cut. Most massively, the couple billion dollars taken out of HUD's uh, programs for low income and public housing. So the net result of this, and I'm sure there's probably some earthquake victims here, is without well, you even being aware of it, you know, you're getting disaster relief that's being financed by the destruction of social programs in the inner city, affordable housing, education, job training programs. And this is the, you know, the curious <clears throat> and very mean result that the poor, who are already being attacked virtually every front by the present Congress, can now expect it to be landed with the bill for future disasters. <clears throat> if Malibu burns again, don't worry, we'll send federal relief. Where will the money come from? Let's find some program in the barrios and ghettos or on a Native American reservation or in some poor rural area of Mississippi and we'll cut, cut it. They turn federal disaster relief essentially into a program of redistribution. Although we're still talking about the scale in Northridge, we're not talking about the scale of the kind of mega disasters that are now predicted. And there seems to be no willingness to do that and there remains this possibility of a kind of regional revolt against Florida and California. Now without FEMA to provide Keynesian ejections of aid, the continuing clustering of disaster, whether on ordinary or extraordinary scales, inevitably will erode many of the traditional comparative advantages of the Southern California economy. Despite, however, the wishful thinking of some deep ecologists who think Gaia would be happiest with a thin sprinkling of hunter-gatherers, megacities like Los Angeles will never simply collapse and disappear. Rather, we will simply stagger on with higher body counts and greater distress through a chain of more frequent and destructive disasters. Vital parts of the region's high-tech and tourist economies may eventually immigrate to safer ground, together with tens of thousands of more affluent residents. Aficionados of complexity theory will marvel at the nonlinear resonances of unnatural disaster and social breakdown as the golden age is superseded forever by strange new chaotic attractors. Thank you. How does this work, Michael? I have bad hearing. Is there a microphone back there? Or? Yeah. Uh, question. Speak loudly. Your mic is
Well, the, the Kobe earthquake, I think, shattered decisively the image that Japan was incomparably better prepared than California uh, to deal with an earthquake uh, you know, disaster. The, I think the Japanese themselves were probably deluded in, in believing that they had such an incredibly more efficient, better system of earthquake preparedness, much greater popular involvement uh, in dealing with earthquakes, superior earthquake engineering, and so on. And that did not prove to be the case. But I think the reaction in, in, in Japan is utterly and totally different from the reaction in California to the Northridge earthquake. The State Seismic Safety Commission is basically unable really to disguise its conclusions, which are quite dire, which show, for example, that hundreds, maybe even a thousand, steel frame buildings, which we'd counted on modern steel frame buildings as being the safest structures in the region, now have fatal flaws. Well, it can't, it can't really deny its conclusions, but at the same time, it's not ready to advocate the levels of expenditure and the kinds of legislation that really should be enacted in, in the aftermath of, of Northridge. We can't afford to do it. You know, legislators would laugh at it in the current economy. So basically, we're refusing to learn anything from Northridge why we, because we can't afford to do it. Japan, and then of course this is a kind of open question, Japan, I would guess, may make some you know, very drastic changes now that it's seen how its system can fail. It may actually learn some lessons and be better prepared. But the basic historical flaw, and it's not just a flaw of, of, of Japan, but it's been a flaw of, of American cities as well, is almost never do cities take the opportunity of disasters to rebuild in different ways. You remember Burnham had this great plan for San Francisco, then came fortuitously the 1906 earthquake. San Francisco ignored Burnham City beautiful plan. You know, Chicago was burnt to the ground in the 19th century two or three times. It ignored the advice of its planners. And Tokyo destroyed twice in the 20th century, in 1923 by an earthquake and in 1945 by genocidal American firebombing. It's rebuilt itself with miter modifications for fire breaks and so on, almost exactly as it was before. It, there's an interesting debate amongst historians why cities have this enormous inertia. Is it mainly a political you know, problem? What is it that prevents taking, seizing these opportunities to turn some of our you know, more blighted cities into the utopias that architects and urban designers you know, want them to be? So the cities recently you know, you know, grown to super city you know, status and the Pacific Rim of Fire now face the period when all the predictions are, you know, are beginning to come true. And you know, I leave it up to your imagination, some of the geopolitical consequences of this. You know, what would a trillion dollars worth of earthquake damage in greater Tokyo mean for a Pacific economy that in many ways is already on the ropes as the Japanese have been facing the, their worst financial and economic crisis of, of, of the 20th century. What would a $200 million event, billion dollar event in Southern California do? How much sympathy would there be in Washington to transfer 50 or $60 billion of taxpayers' money from the Midwest and the East Coast to Los Angeles, which is already kind of being written off politically? you know, by most, you know, most of the country. I mean, I, I leave open the question, is, is, am I engaging in hyperbole and, and kind of the dark imagination by which I make a living? Or is there a kind of almost unavoidable logic to this? And of course, what's so interesting is having gone through this kind of golden age when nature, you know, acted out the role of the real estate speculators and the sun shined and very few disasters happened and you know, everything was happy in Southern California. Now we have this, this extremely fascinating you know, coincidence you know, of natural and social disaster with of course the provision that none of the natural disasters are truly natural. They're the results of bad, bad planning and socially unjust uh, politics. Other questions please?
from the, the world perspective and international perspective, this, this is a really fascinating question. I think it was the Independent in London after the LA riots had some huge headline that said, you know, superpowers, second biggest city, you know, in, you know, in, in, in flames. And of course, nobody, you know, in Europe or, or urban East Asia can imagine a country that retains the, the economic military uh, power of the United States simply writing off its second largest city. But in many senses, this is exactly what happened. Remember the aftermath of the 92 riots. Every presidential candidate came and stood in the rubble of South Central LA and pledged to do something about LA for the first time since the middle of the Carter administration. You heard the word city again. Three months later in the presidential debates, the word city entirely disappeared. I listened to those debates very carefully. I did not hear that word uttered once. Because city now has a whole other set of meanings. It means black, it means Latino, it means poor, it means Democrat. And what in fact has happened? What has been the reaction to you know, the 92 riots and the other you know, social crisis in LA? Well, I mean, I, I think it's, it's definitive now what's happened. You know, we have the county budget crisis. We have a series of riots in the legislature over the last three years that have eviscerated the social safety net in Southern California. We've had the total crash and burn and destruction of the Clinton administration's infrastructure program within a few months of its taking power. And we have you know, a Republican majority in Congress which is preparing to eliminate immense categories of programs, which has just eliminated any citizen right to health care or housing in, you know, you know, in the United States. Now, if you add all that up and you compare it against what LA has happened, it does look like this country, this suburban country, this country where the majority of voters now live in edge cities or suburbs, is prepared to write off its inner cities and is prepared perhaps to write off Los Angeles. Los Angeles suffers from the fact that while it had a certain utopian relationship to the rest of the country, most people don't like LA. People in Rockford and Sioux Falls and you know, Cobb County, they, they don't like people in Los Angeles. If you talk about LA being destroyed by fire and brimstone and pestilence, and I talk about this in all my classes, and it's a Pavlovian reaction, even those of us born and bred here smile, our faces light up. I don't know if you'd talk the same way about Columbus or Cleveland, okay? And so LA, at the end of the day, has few friends. And the city of Los Angeles even has few friends in the county. When our Tories went to the state legislature after the 92 riots, merely to ask for the same temporary one half percent sales tax surcharge that San Francisco got after Loma Prieta, he was drowned out you know, in a firestorm of opposition and nasty words from other suburban legislatures, Democrats as well as Republicans. And no voices were louder than the entire Orange County delegation who just, of course, got their own big, uh, you know, you know, bailout. So I think this is a very, you know, a very profound question. And in 1992, the answer was, was left open. It seemed maybe the middle class in the suburbs had realized that you can't just abandon the cities, because if you do, all the pathologies of abandonment will eventually find their way out to the suburbs. You know, whether that's white middle class youth joining gangs and killing each other, you know, or it's the epidemic diseases from destroying public health, which won't confine themselves to the inner city. It seemed in 92, maybe people began to understand this and would make some token reinvestment in the cities. It hasn't happened. You know, the record is loud and clear. The only thing we're prepared seemingly to make any large investment in is building the world's biggest prison system. Another question?
I don't think so. I, I don't, I mean, this, this is not scientific. This is just a, you know, my own impression. I, I don't think most, the rest of the country feels that Los Angeles is really part of this country at all. And I think they're somehow aware, they may not know the actual facts, that Los Angeles is in some sense an artifact of a Cold War mobilization that shifted enormous amounts of tax resources from the rest of the country to, to irrigate these, these aerospace oases and you know, military bases and, and, and so on. Because I haven't talked about, or I haven't even alluded to, the biggest disaster of all, which is the economy, which is something that we just know. We have no cultural DNA after 50 years of continuous boom to deal with an economy that can no longer produce the miracle of just tens of thousands of high wage jobs. And in a sense, it's only been jobs and the creation of jobs that's held LA together. That's the real civic culture. Sure, there are ethnic islands of sensibility and culture. Many of them is, you know, radiant and, and, and interesting as you'd find in the rest of the country. But as a, you know, as a society, the thing that glues us together has been growth. You know, the longest boom in American history. Now you look, where's the growth in the West? It's in Las Vegas. At the end of the 20th century, the American West had turned to prisons and casinos and theme parks. I mean, what a, what a peculiar you know, you know, fate. But we're coming apart at the seams because of that. We only seem to be able to create low-wage jobs to the extent we create jobs at all. And it's also increasing the gulf between Northern and Southern California. The Bay Area is the per capita richest of the major metropolitan areas of the country. It went through its major structural economic crisis in the early 1980s and emerged from it. It has few of the weaknesses or the sources of conflict that Southern California has. And I think you're going to see, you know, an increasing, you know, what's already a fairly wide, you know, cultural and political gulf between the two Californias. I think there are, are, are two separate points there. The first point has to do with the question of what has been the mainspring of the world economy and of world prosperity in the 20th century. And I would argue that the, the golden age of Cold War capitalism from the end of uh, the Second World War and the reconstruction of Germany through to the 1972-73 uh, Nixon you know, recession it was not driven by trade. Trade was a byproduct of what economists call market deepening, of the fact that millions of white collar, but particularly blue collar workers, were able to afford to buy things like the cars they made, which they previously couldn't buy. In other words, the economies of the major capitalist company, countries were regulated by collective bargaining, by powerful unions, which raised wages, raised demand, and also forced capital to deal with high raises by investing in productivity and, you know, in technology. That dynamic created unprecedented, uh, you know, affluence, but it came to an end in the 70s. The so-called Pacific Rim economy that has replaced that Atlantic economy works on entirely different principles. With certain exceptions, it works not by entitling more people 
to become you know, mass consumers, but by a system of, of imbalances between production and consumption, you know, which is ultimately unsustainable. And one of the greatest illusions, mass illusions, so you could call it mass hysteria, that I think we've seen in our lifetimes, it was what was happening in LA in the 80s when everybody was walking around saying, oh, who cares if some defense plants close? There's an infinite mass of yen parked right offshore. Look, the Japanese, they'll buy anything. You know, even things like the Arco Cowers, boy, are they silly, but you know, this immense amount of capital coming on shore. Every time you turned around, there was some big new conference talking about the Pacific Rim, you know, Miracle, all the best-selling, you know, books were about that. And somehow we couldn't see that all this capital coming toward us was just our trade deficit being shot back toward us. One, because it wouldn't be invested in things like better housing in Japan by the conservative government of Japan. And two, because it had very little place you know, you know, to go except to be invested in kind of costly, tro costly trophies in Southern California. This is an utterly unsustainable economic system and it's failed. And I would go so far as to argue that since the early 70s, on a world scale, you have not added a single new mass consumer. That is, you've not added a single person who's now you know, able to live at a higher standard of living through higher wages and because they work more productively. What you've done is, 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 is you've changed the whole dynamic of the world economy from mass consumption and the growth of wages to economies that are dynamized by economic inequalities, like the American economy, which has gone through the greatest you know, upward distribution of wealth than you know, any of us uh, have ever seen. You know, I could go on with this and how LA fits into it, but the second part of it, which is really relevant to the environmental crisis, and I think you're entirely right, is that the last generation has been the lost generation in Latin America. In Africa, it's an apocalyptic generation, one of the greatest survival crises in human history is going on right now in Africa. And what's been happening, of course, is that nations have seen all the growth, all the development that took place in the 60s has been wiped away and been lost for a variety of reasons, but above all because of the huge level of debt countries have occurred. In order to pay off that debt at the same time that the prices of their exports, their staple raw material products have been falling on the world market, they've had to increase production. This is what happened on the cattle ranges of Southern California in the 1850s and 1860s. For a few years during the gold rush, the haciendados, both the Californios and, and their Yankee son-in-laws, suddenly found this infinite demand for meat. You had 100,000 you know, hungry miners without women up on the mother load, and they just wanted all the beef they could get. So suddenly cattle, which had just been sold for their, for their hides, became incredibly valuable. So, you know, they couldn't put enough cattle into the hills. You couldn't, you know, the, the money that was being made was incredible. But within a few years, Texans came with herd of cattle. People started raising cattle in the Central Valley. So as the price of cattle fell, the ranchers in Southern California kept adding on to the cattle. They kept producing more capital to keep, keep up with the falling prices. So many cattle were added to the ranges that when a drought came, it was a catastrophe. And you turn the landscape into a desert. The arroyos that are products of the erosion of that cycle are still visible all over here. On a kind of microcosm, that's what's happened in most of the developing world. You've had to push on the accelerator of the exploitation of natural resources just to keep even, run in place, against the terms of trade and the massive debt load. There have been inside this a whole series of economic miracles, but if you look at these economic miracles, particularly in Brazil and Mexico, they only involve the middle classes, okay? And they've been short-lived. Short Think of the, you know, the golden visions that were made just two years ago, you know, about NAFTA. And look at Mexico today, you know, you know, seeing wages and salaries, you know, you know, cut by 40 percent. What is going to be the reaction again to increase the exploitation of, re, you know, of resources? I would argue that as much environmental damage was done in the 1980s to this planet as was done in the whole 20th century, maybe in 200 years of, you know, you know, you know, of industrialism. So, to some extent, then, the environmental crisis, in which were now really entering global warming and everything else, is not just a result of industrialism per se, 
but it's specifically the result you know, of, of the kind of international political economy you know, of, the, you know, of the last 20 years. There's a deep, profound relationship at many levels between exploding social inequality uh, you know, and what looks to some people like a dying planet. Uh, I have to s introduce an advertisement at, uh, at this point, uh, which is that I'm right now involved in writing an article. I've just discovered that the Clinton administration is allowing the French government to fly men and materials to Tahiti for its nuclear test over the United States, and that the planes are actually landing and refueling at LAX. And uh, Greenpeace and the magazine New Scientist uh, last week went and talked to the State Department and asked them if they knew what was in the planes and whether it contained the plutonium subassemblies for the French hydrogen bomb that will be uh, dropped either tomorrow or on Friday. The State Department said it never asked the French what was in their planes. And I suddenly had this image of all the other disasters I've had to write about lately. We have <laughs> French planes with hydrogen bombs crashing, you know, into that giant donut in Westchester on the approach to, uh, you know, to LAS. Uh, one more question. Michael? Uh, take drugs, listen to bad music, read, read dark, pessimistic novels. Uh, <laughs> nothing's worse than insincere optimism or, 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 or false hopes. At the other time, I'm well aware, it's my 13-year-old daughter who looks greatly askance at uh, most of the things I write and say. She pointed out to me one time, and I, I'd never realized this. She says, Dad, you're still out there in the 60s thinking you're organizing people, but all you're telling them is how hopeless the world is. That doesn't organize anybody. And, you know, and I agree uh, you know, completely. I mean, I think one thing that in this particular context of this school that we have to hold on to and we have to kind of revive was this little moment that occurred a couple of years ago when some of the you know, leading architects of all different camps you know, began to come together about a certain vision of the city, began to understand that you cannot have a real politics of social justice or environmental responsibility in Los Angeles without it being expressed in a vision of what the city should be. It has to be some vision of urban you know, design and that architects have a, a small you know, but real role in that. And nothing like that had really happened since the 1940s, since the war years, when modernist architects and New Deal planners had come together around a progressive city government to talk about building a new kind of city, about eliminating poverty in LA, about new forms of social housing. You know, you had a moment where, you know, creative design, the kind of cutting edge of, of, of design, and progressive politics were in a a very sympathetic, you know, resonance to each other. And something like that happened after the rebellion. It happened around the short-lived campaign of Nick, you know, you know, you know, Pizzoras. And that's a seed that needs to be encouraged more than, you know, ever. And I think any or all the initiatives that exist to keep that dialogue and discussion going and to make design relevant to environmental and social justice issues, uh, you know, needs to be done in a greater, you know, a greater urgency than ever. Thank you.